going to proceed as I intended to because I've built some, some word stuff in here, even though Mark has done almost all the welcoming. Welcome to tortoise, which is a noun repurposed as a proper <laughs> noun. Uh, this is a thinking. We do a lot of inventing words here. It's not that late, but it's a late. And, um, uh, and, uh, and it's about words, how they work, how we so often get them wrong, why we get them wrong, why they sometimes scare us, whether we have enough of them, whether social media is making us use less of them, how it's affecting our vocabulary, and uh, whether in the end we have the words we need. Um, and I suppose uh, how you can use them to build a glittering career, make it look so easy. And just to prove that I've read most of your book, I think there's a bit of Egg of Columbus there, possibly? Oh, yes, yes. Anyway. Um, okay. Welcome. I Thank hope you, you feel welcome. Do you feel that I you're in a place welcome. where I we respect blinded, words? I feel slightly so I'm going to start Well, we just I'm look at each other squinting. rather than exactly. that. Yeah, I'll, I'll just look at you like this. But um, thank you no, you're, for the you're introduction. Welcome. Uh, yes, Egg of Columbus is an idea that seems uh, very easy once you know how. Really. Once you know how. Um, yeah. Yes. And that was, a, do you want me to tell the story? Yeah, go one? on. Yeah. Oh, it's just an apocryphal story about how um, Christopher Columbus was uh, with some other explorers who said, ah, oh, now nah, we could have done what you did. That's easy. Um, so he set them a task, which was to um, make an egg stand upright on a table, and nobody could do it. And he simply tapped the uh, the egg, broke the shell, made it flat. I don't know what quite it must it be had a to hard be boiled. Boiled. Egg, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it stood up, and that is so called the egg of Columbus. That he got his own back. It doesn't sound nearly as good as um, as it probably was at the time, but yeah, <laughs> an, an idea that. It's easy once you know how to do it. I find myself thinking about that stuff the whole time. There's so many, so many things that if you know, if it, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like like running thinkings. Uh, <laughs> piece of piece of <laughs> piece of housekeeping. This is supposed to be a free for all, really. Um, it's less serious than the ones we sometimes host. Last night it was Alzheimer's. But uh, please feel free to yell out, dive in. You can't do it electronically, but um, I'm going to say, raise your hand if you think we might see you through the glare. If no, <laughs> if nobody's paying attention, as I say, just yell. And I will. There will be some actual earmarked opportunities for you to do that. Um, I did send Mark some some words ahead of time. Do we do we have them? Uh, some words that we can pull up. I'm just interested to know if anyone. Uh, when you see them in the room, knows what any of them mean. They do all have something in common. Uh. <laughs> oh, all right. So let's just let's just run through them, can we? Yeah. Oh, I should be stiff rumped. I like the idea of being stuff rumped, but you can be stiff rumped as well. <laughs> <laughs> I love that one. Oh yeah. That's just a selection. They all have something in common, which is they have either appeared uh, in your word of the day, shared with more than a million Twitter followers, uh, or in this fabulous book, or in this, which is one of many predecessors, Emotional Dictionary, um, signed copies afterwards. Um, does anyone know what any of them mean? Yes? Yeah. Go on. The first one, uh, like uh, um, charlatan. Sort of. Fanfaron? Yeah, because they, 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 what are you, as you native Italian, Italian yeah. yeah. They're, they're it's brilliant because there's lots of um, equivalents in other languages and they all go back to the same ancestry. Yeah, exactly that. A charlatan is somebody who's so convinced of their own uh, superiority uh, that they just uh, are a blustering braggart and go around just sort of, you know, <laughs> strutting the stage. There are so, so many words like half snuff. Uh, Bloviator. Uh, I mean, so many words for people who love the sound of their own voice. And so many yeah. people who love the sound of their own voice. Yes, exactly. <laughs> no, I'm not referring to you. I, I, I was just, so did, did you know that because you're Italian? Yes. Yeah. Not because it was a word of the day a couple of days ago. <laughs> you're not a follower. Okay. So it was a word of the day a couple of day, days ago. How do you choose them? And mm. are they in any sense of public service, a running commentary on <laughs> current affairs? No, they're not a public service at all. Uh, so just sometimes they might be inspired by a, a, an event of the time. So yes, yesterday's was about Putin. I mean, that was a bit obvious, really, to me anyway. The fanfaron was Putin yes, in that case. That right. was, yeah. Um, but 
sometimes they are I, I i my timeline is full of pictures of boris johnson at least it used to be because i would always tweet things like uh, i don't know hingham tringham which is barely presentable just about hanging together and i tweeted <laughs> i tweeted that at 8 30 in the morning because that's exactly how i felt so a lot of them were kind of self-referential but they're like oh i know who that you know who that is but the lovely thing about this is that people pick them up and think they, you know, they apply them to their whatever context right. they want to. Uh, so I had a lot of Australian Prime Minister um, applications, so insults for those. Um, oh, I don't know who else did I have. Lo lots of people populating my timeline who actually I didn't have in mind at, at the beginning. Right. Uh, so they're usually inspirations of the moment. I don't have a whole load. The, the only one actually. Um, if I'm trying to think over the last few years, there, there, were, there was just one which was planned and I knew the moment was sadly going to come. And that was recrudescence, which is when, unfortunately, Trump announced his um, comeback. And oh, recrudescence, yes. recrudescence yeah. is the return of something unpleasant after a period of relief. <laughs> and I did have that. I chanced on that one a couple of years ago and I thought I know exactly when I'm going to use that one. Um, <laughs> But yeah, normally I promise you they're just sort of, you know, whatever I'm feeling at the time. So there are quite a few repeats in there, particularly when it comes to oversleeping or not quite feeling up to it or just futzing about, quiddling. Quiddling? quiddling is, quiddling is um, spending a lot of time on trivial matters as a way of avoiding the important ones. Yeah. All of these are about 500 years old. That's the brilliant thing. Um, and there's another one which absolutely describes you now, Giles, probably. Uh, and maybe a lot of people here today, which is from the 15th century and born I'm for Zoom, nervous. Zoom meetings as well. No, it's nod crafty. And we all are nod crafty. And that is essentially having the knack of nodding your head as if you understand everything <laughs> that someone is saying when you actually tuned out quite a while ago. I'm not saying you tuned out, but, um, you know, how, we're all nod crafty, aren't we? But obviously they were in the 16th century. Does nod crafty specifically mean nodding when you don't understand? It's nodding your head with an air of great wisdom is how it's defined in the dictionary. So it clearly is when you're making, you know, all the appearances of understanding what we're going along with something when actually you're just somewhere else. Yeah. You may un unfortunately have an opportunity to use fanfaron and bloviator and recrudescence all over again quite soon if the local elections go back. This isn't supposed to be about politics, but yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. So you, you might recycle a bit then, or I do recycle. Yeah. Um, I figured that. I mean, I just there are a few tweeters that say, well, "Didn't you have this one before?" But so, so quite often I will say it as a reminder of a word because they are. I mean, they're just so useful again and again and again. And you, I don't think you have Mumpsimus in there, but that's another one where I just think, why did this ever fall out of use? It, the dictionary loves a good insult. And this one is, um, again, four or five centuries old. And a Mumpsimus is someone who insists that they're right, despite clear evidence that they're not. Oh. Um, and, you know, we all know at least a dozen Mumpsimuses. We may even be one. Um, and yet it's just faded away. And they have lovely stories attached. That's about a Roman Catholic priest that got his communion mass wrong. But um, yeah, there's these little adventures behind them. Speaking of which, thank you for the segue. Okay. Let us, in the time-honoured manner of, of, of interviews, even though this is actually a thinking, go back to the beginning briefly. Yes. How did it all begin? You yeah. went to a convent. Was yeah. it even before then that you realised you loved words or did it kick in at school? Um both, I think. So my first love was German. I had a fantastic German teacher um, who fills me with love for the language because it is, despite all um, expectations to the contrary, it's the most lyrical language. I mm. think it's just beautiful. Um, so that was my first love. But yeah, I remember I always tell the story of sitting in the bath and looking age three or four, maybe one of my earliest memories, and looking at shampoo bottles and seeing what seemed to me the most exotic characters swirling around on that. On, I mean, honestly, let's face it, there must have been acetyl diethylide or something, but I was so excited by this. And obviously- I So you weren't even at, looking at the, the brands of the shampoo, you were looking at the I ingredients. I was just looking at the ingredients. So, and even now, I'm sure I'm not, I hope I'm not alone in this. If there's a ketchup bottle on the table, I have to read the label. Even if the conversation is really scintillating around me, I ha I'm just drawn to the written word. Blimey. I know, I'm very sad. <laughs> and, and, and tell us about the spilling test. Oh, the spilling test, yes. So this was penance, um, really. So, yes, in convent, basically, you have to confess to your sins. And when you're, you know, 11 or so, you don't really have that many. So uh, I think I used to say that I had stolen a pencil or 
you know, I, I used to have to make things up basically. I mean, it wasn't perfect at all, but it was quite hard to find really big sins to come up with, um, especially if you were going to a convent. So the spilling, yeah. So that was um, going to confession. That was the that was the spilling test, and then you would get. Um, your penance, you would get your Hail Marys or whatever that you had to say afterwards, depending on the gravity of the sin. Yeah. And, and there was a there was a 3M, no, no, 3M, made, they made the, the post-it notes. A 3M, yes. So it was um, it was a riff on, um, to send, and it's anyone old enough to remember, was it 2HB, the pencils? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so it was like 3HB or something, I can't remember. It was a riff on that, which we all thought was very funny because, again, we were very sad. Um, <laughs> and, um, yeah, so it, I think I mentioned that in Tribes, don't I, because it's just a really good example of how everybody has this tribal language. You know, we all, you'll all have it here. Um, that's where the sneaky disco comes in. Yeah. Um, which is... Oh, is it, is there's, a, there's a donut as well, isn't there? Um, I don't know whether they still have donuts in, in media. In the tribe book? Yes. Donuts. So in radio, in broadcasting, essentially, a donut is when there is the presenter in the studio, someone outside, and then another presenter. So it's a three way talk, um, and they call that a donut. And the sneaky disco is. You have to remind me what sneaky disco I think is. I think it's the discussion between the disco. two people who yeah. were sat in the green room not talking, yeah. and then live. They start talking about something that is unexpected by the producer or the presenter? Quite possibly. Something like this that? This is very bad that I can't remember that. What, what's in there? But, well, yeah, I mean, it was just, it was so, it was really fun because even in those days at school, I would write weird things down in my book. Uh, I had a little black book, which only dent fashion did it contain lots of words. It didn't contain any exciting phone numbers or anything. Um, and I would, I would just scribble all these down. So I've got thousands of notebooks and I didn't have a clue what those meant myself at the time. Um, and then, you know, you know, we all, some of us are cyclists, some of us are um, bird watchers, whatever. We've all got our, our own shorthand, which I just love. And there are secret languages because we don't tune into them if we're not part of them. And you're an Arsenal fan. I want to come back to that. Yeah. And, uh, and cruelly, I want to test you on uh, some vocab that you've put into your most recent book. With, okay. So you have least excuse for forgetting them. But, we'll come to that. <laughs> but please, everyone, okay. bear, be thinking of things for which you want a word or wish there was a word or wonder if there is a word. Uh, because I want to come back to that. I want to devote a whole section of this while we, start, oh, while yeah, we have to time. Gaps. To, okay. to, to linguistic gaps. To linguistic gaps and the extent to which other languages uh, Can fill, them. fill them. But yeah. first, um, while we're doing the bio bit, when did you first realise that words were funny and you could be funny? Was it around the kitchen with words? I'm not funny. Oh, look, you mean one? Look, one could be I, funny, not me personally. You can use words to be funny. That's what one that's, can. Yeah. But I tend you only do. no, I tend only to it genuinely. The only times I have had guffaws from the audiences of eight out of ten cats just count down is when I've said something funny by mistake. Um, <laughs> so I honestly don't realise at the time what it is that I've said. Uh, so I remember this was in regular countdown. Actually, I was trying to spice up. Of we we do five shows a day on countdown, three and three day blocks. So by the fifteenth show, you were on your knees really, and um, I thought I'd spice things up a little bit and do the origins of the language of underwear. And it was Nick Hewitt at the time was the host. And um, anyway, I was going through you know camis and. Um, I don't know, bras, where they go. So men used to wear bras, for example. They were the first to wear bras. So I was talking about all of this. Who were the first to wear bras? Men, because men. a bras brassiere was an arm protector. So the French bras is an arm. And so they were part of um, coats of armour. Uh, and then, yeah, anyway, so men were the first to wear bras. But then I got to a teddy. Does anyone know about Yeah. yeah. And silk teddies, you know, that kind of thing. And I looked straight over at Nick and I said, Nick, I don't know if you've ever come across a teddy. <laughs> no idea what I had said. Rachel to my right was bent over double. I had Martin Lewis, I think, to my left. And I could see they were crying with laughter. And only on the train home did I get it. Um, so this is, yes, I do appreciate that language and words can be incredibly funny, but not usually from my mouth, Giles, I have to say. And as a recent convert to 8 out of 10 Cats Does Countdown... Um, cats Down is much what, easier to say. We just call it Cats Down. Cats Down. Yes. Uh, I found myself this afternoon watching you apparently playing rugby in, a, in, a, in, a, in an ad break, <laughs> not in an ad break, but in a break, with someone who was pretending to be Jimmy... Was there a lot of stuff like that with oh, hi yeah, highly choreographed? Quite, no, and then he yeah. threw the ball at you and the cardboard cut out of you fall over and you stand... Yes. Yeah, that's yeah a so routine. I go up in the air and... 
Uh, yeah, I don't. I mean, usually it's a dummy. Obviously, it's right. a mannequin of me. I have had um, I had a very close shave with a motorbike coming riding over me. I stupidly volunteered for that one, and it didn't quite go the same as it did in rehearsal. But um, but yeah, just ridiculous things. I mean, it's that's what's so wonderful about them. You mentioned the mascots before we came on air. Sean Locke's mascots. If anyone remembers those, were just so good, uh, and. Yeah, it's just, uh, they put a lot of effort and, and clearly have got quite a big budget for, for that side of things. And um, and Joe Wilkinson, you never know what he's going to come out with. <laughs> or so, come out on, to be fair. He's usually, <laughs> he's usually riding some sort of weird contraption. So as a straight uh, um, person in comedy Stooge. in the comedy sense, yes. the, the, um, you who loves words but doesn't necessarily th- consider yourself funny, mm. you go from convent to Oxford to OUP, where you're a lexicographer, and almost immediately someone comes up to you and says, why don't you apply to be on this show? How was that so quick? Are there, are there word yeah. scouts? Is it like football? <laughs> <laughs> no, that was some such a blue stockinged trajectory that I did get. I did live well, in, tell us about the rest of it. I did live in New York and, and for quite a while before I went back to Oxford. So You went to um, Princeton? Yes, I went to Princeton. So that's still, still sounds, a bit. Okay, yeah, so I'm back. Still I'm blue trying to, trying to you know, jazz it up a little bit. Um, yes, what happened was Oxford, they, they still do actually, Oxford Dictionaries, uh, they have an arrangement with a Countdown to provide the dictionary that's used right. on the show. So there was always a connection there. And my boss was uh, the marketing director, actually. And I'd been there, I don't know, a month or so. And he said they're looking for people to sit in the corner. And at that time, there were lots of people rotating, uh, you know, for, for years and years. There were, I think we went up maybe two or three times a year and that was it, each of us. Um, anyway, I said no quite a few times because that was not where I thought. I mean, I'd just been happiest below the radar, really. And um, and he just kept persisting and then told me it would be extremely good for my job if I did it. And I didn't have a choice, really. But I'll, I'll be very grateful to him for that, always. So wait a minute. Uh, you had to screen test and that kind of stuff? Well, yeah, weirdly. I did. I, I Actually, did I have a screen test? No, I think I went up sat in the gallery for a show and then was on with Rula Lenska. So, yeah. Was it scary? Yes. Oh, gosh, the evidence is there on YouTube. I'm literally sitting there like this. And I think I look quite arrogant, but actually, yes, I was absolutely terrified. I couldn't really talk. And and did you ever freeze or or have out-of-body experiences? Um, not so much then. I do sometimes have them. I, we just come back from filming um, yesterday, actually, and Colin Murray had one of those moments, because Colin is our current presenter, who, ever since I've known him from his Radio 1 days, has wanted to be the presenter of Countdown. That is all he's wanted to do. He said, I will give up anything to present this show. And he said yesterday, he he suddenly started laughing in the middle of a quite serious game, and he said, I've just realised I'm presenting Countdown. It was just so, <laughs> uh, yeah, so I think we do. We do pinch ourselves sometimes. And I've just had my 30th anniversary on there, so that was a bit of a weird one too. Blimey. I know. I mean, maybe a round of applause. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. There's a word in the book, gongoozling. Mm. This is what I mean by out-of-body experiences. When, yeah. when suddenly you... I mean, maybe you don't do it. Maybe it's sufficiently scripted that you have a sort of safety net. But I can just imagine, because uh, these lights, they do it, don't they? I'm really bad with lights, actually. Uh, I usually start crying when, um, I mean, the, my eyes just brought tear up. But um, yes, gongoozling Gong had a really specific application to watching activity on water. So it was ah. literally people sitting uh, on the side of a canal normally and just watching what was going on on the canal boats and then eventually was transferred over to somebody who's just stares protractedly at anything really including a cup of tea in my case um but it's just such a good word could you use it about what they call ball watching in football ball watching when, when as a as a player mm. you kind of Get stop hypnotized. stop playing and just let the other guys through and I ask you as an oh, Arsenal yeah, fan, yeah. <laughs> Wenger is quoted in the book, not from open source material, but from your own conversations with us and Wenger, right? Well, sadly, though, they were, they were, I'd love to say I sat in a room with them. I didn't. Um, it was it was all via email. But, um, yeah, he was, he's why I love Wenger because, as I say in Tribes in the book, he he's very experimental with language. I mean, he, he's multilingual. 
Um, but he knowingly introduces these new sort of adverbs. So footballistically was the famous one. I just footballistically, we were a little handbrake today. Um, and he's transferring straight over from German or French into English. And absolutely no, straight faced. He's not trying to be funny. No, no, no. no. Just like you. It just might be. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so that, that was fab, actually. And I just, you know, I said, well, why, why are managers so boring? Why is the post-match interview so boring? Because it's so predictable. And he said, because we, we deliberately play a straight bat so that we won't get quoted for anything ridiculous. So in his case, anyway. Now, I want to give the, the book a bit of a plug because oh, it, it is really fun to dip in and out of. Thank you. Now, I wonder, actually, if there's a word for, for a loo book. Yeah. Well, speaking of, <laughs> speaking of loo books, yes. what, something you said earlier reminded me of one that you didn't write called The Book of Answers, which I stared at for a long time. You know the way you can sometimes sit in a loo and stare at a book for a long time because you're doing other things and, uh, and not pick it up? And then eventually I picked it up. And uh, I thought, how can you have a book of answers um, and your without knowing the questions? And um, it, it is somewhat of a tangent, but it's sort of applicable to everything, universal in the same way. I realised when I opened it, um, uh, my question was about my pension. And, I opened, and oh. the instruction was to open it at random. So yeah. I did. And the answer was, you don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolute, absolutely true. But anyway, That's brilliant. Ev everything here is, yes. is, is, is wonderfully ap applicable in so many ways. And, and I, so I was wondering if, if there is a word for the feeling of being the funniest, most educated person in the room, having only acquired a very, very superficial uh, knowledge of various things from dipping in and out of a book. Oh, Do you okay. think there is one? For you, um, hmm, that's very specific. It is, isn't it? Yes. Um, the most knowledgeable person in the room uh, who's got a good grasp of something, having only dipped into it lightly. So you're not a dilettante, you're sort of, we need, we need a blend, a portmanteau of someone who is um, a dilettante and yet extremely Dilimanto. Dilimanto. Dilimanto or dilettante? Dilimanto, dilly. I don't anyway. know. I actually don't know the answer to that. That's, that's as we were talking before we came on about um, linguistic gaps, and, and there are so many in English. I mean, there are lots of gaps we can fill through the historical dictionary, but um, normally everyone says, oh, German will have a word for it. Um, right. And usually they do, but not always. Well, let's get on to that because, okay. um, uh, and please, this is a good moment for anyone. If, if there's something that you've wanted a word for and you're frustrated because you don't think it exists, please yell out. And just to sort of, sort of, um, get things going. I want, there's a, there are lots of German words here. Yes. And so they include uh, Eilkrankheit, Zeitenwende I put in because it's a, it's a new one from Schultz's current predicament with Ukraine, but um, yeah. Hamsterkauf, Zugzwang, mm. Fernweh, uh, Frenchsham, or French, Frenchsham, yeah. yeah. So, uh, I mean, uh, you can tell us if you can remember what they mean. But my question is, do the Germans have feelings that we don't because they've got no, words for them? It's such a good question. It's a really good question about um, how language is determined and whether it is um, shaped by a culture or whether a culture is shaped by language. And so that's a linguistic determinism <laughs> debate. It's been going on for a very long time. Um, there, there was a lovely... There was a. Um, a French scientist or anthropologist who did this wonderful study of different languages and said that um, Mediterranean languages, like Italian, they're just, they're very sibilant. There's they're sort of, there's something soothing. There's a lot of S's and just sort of wonderful melody about them that kind of reflect the sort of, you know, the, the sunny backlit, backlight that, that they operate against. Whereas he said the um, further north you get sounds that I think he says that are like crunching snow and cracking furs. Um, they're much, much harder. And I think he was thinking particularly of, uh, of German, although I would say it's got lovely softness about it. Um, so it's a really good question. And, and there are arguments for and against. No one has managed to, you know, to say, yes, definitely a culture is determined by its language or, you know, or vice versa. But um, the German, I mean, German itself, 
lends itself so beautifully to describing emotions because it is like Lego, ultimately, famously. You know, we can just have these linguistic pile-ups. We can take words and just create these wonderful confections. And I think that's where its elasticity, it lends itself to describing emotions really well. Right, I'm I'm not crafting really enthusiastically here because because yes. it's a sort of Lego nature of of the language. You can build I words. Think, I think so, but it's very uh, the, w another wonderful thing I really notice about German is it's full of melancholy and yearning and wistfulness, and it does it way better, I think, than we do. We have lovely words like desiderate, which doesn't sound so nice, but it's to. Um, to look to the stars and yearn for something that you once had but have now lost. And all of that is encompassed in that word. And it's got um, a con uh, constellation at its heart. Um, so that's lovely. But the Germans just do something very special when it comes to longing. And so a lot of the ones that you mentioned there are, um, are about sort of difficulties in life. So I can't count is hurry sickness. It's just chasing your tail constantly. It's just, you know, never quite getting there. Fremdscham, I think we've all felt this. This is um, stranger humiliation. So that's seeing someone, might be on telly, might be in the street or whatever, undergoing something which is incredibly cringy and humiliating and feeling real sympathy, for. but shame for them. So it's stranger shame is, is how it would translate then. Um, and then obviously they've given a Schadenfreude, which is probably yeah. the most famous one. Um, Wald Einsamkeit, did you mention that one? That's beautiful. There's a big thing at the moment to do with finding solitude and serenity under a canopy of trees. So in Japan, they have Shinrin Yoku, which is forest bathing, which is a, quite a big thing. And in German, they've got Wald Einsamkeit, which is forest solitude. And I think that's beautiful as well. They read nature very well. Let's be honest, these are German words. Yes. They're not in, in wide use them in. Yes. In, in English. There is also an issue with some of the more exotic and beautiful words that are in the uh, Oxford English Dictionary, yeah. which is, I suggest, but maybe yeah. I'm wrong, that if you use them, mm. uh, because they're so unusual, I know. it just sounds pompous and, and showy-offy rather than uh, evocative as you want it to be. I totally agree with that. And and I, there isn't really an easy answer to it, except um, I think if, if you use them enough and if you get them out there enough, um, then they start to be picked up and they, they can carry their own without having to be defined. And there's one really good example of that, which is I've been on a mission for years to bring back apricity. Apricity. Yeah, which is, um, there's one record of that from 1523, 1623 in the dictionary, and it's the warmth of the sun on a winter's day. And it's so beautiful. And others have discovered it. I don't think it's because of me. Others have discovered it at the same time. And weather presenters are starting to use it. And I think it might catch on, you know, finally. Really? Weather yeah. presenters? Has anyone yeah, heard oh, yeah. apricity? Five, there's Five that Lives. Is... Simon King loves this word um, <laughs> on Five Lives. So, yes. And, and it, they are beginning to pick it up. It's been used in Canada by weather presenters. They've sent me a little YouTube to it. I mean, obviously, they're saying what it is. They're not just saying, oh, there's some wonderful apricity okay. here and leaving it that. But, you know, it is it is getting out there. And, and there's another And it's one. not just related to April being the cruelest no, month. It's the whole of winter. It's not related to... Um, well, it may be related to apricots if you go far, back far enough. But, um, no, it's related to the Latin apricate, which is to bask in the sun. But it's it's got that very specific meaning of the warmth of the sun on your back in winter. Wow. I know. It's great. And there's another one that people might be beginning to use, which is almost the opposite of schadenfreude, and that is confelicity. And that is joy in someone else's happiness. Like, you know, altruistic joy, no mm. agenda, nothing. You're just happy, so happy for them, which I think is beautiful too. And they prisity so, so perfect for late February. Yeah. Yeah, which is so often a uh, deceitful month as the daffs come out and then it yeah. gets rainy. And, it's true. Uh, like today. Look, I, I was, I'm going to test you just, just to... Oh, no. I, okay. I, because um, uh, I, I'll probably just read out the name, the word, and see if you can remember the meaning of it. <laughs> Empliomania. Oh, yeah. Oh, gosh, haven't we seen loads of this? Empliomania is the manic thirst to hold public office. Um, <laughs> or if you're stiff rumped, to hold on to it no matter what. So, stiff rump is someone who will not budge. So, that was useful for Trump as well, I have to say. 
And, and would that be another 500-year-old word or...? Uh, stiff ramp is... No, I mean empleomania. Oh, empleomania. No, I think that is... It's actually from Spain, the empleo bit, because it's about employment. Um, and I think it's probably only 200 years old. And it was specifically used for Spain originally. And then, you know, got widely used. But it does it. show that the Matt Hancock syndrome is not new. Yeah, I mean, yeah. nothing is... That's right. the thing. Nothing is, nothing. is new. There, and during the pandemic as well, I think there was some solace in knowing that quarantine went back to the black plague in venice and the fact that ships had to stay out at port um for 40 days and 40 galanta anyway um i'm going off on a tangent which is what i always do but i think there is there is reassurance in the fact that we've been there before and the dictionary proves it yeah so empleomania is another good example amazing well we can't see into the lights, but if there is anyone who's... Oh, actually, if I do that, I can... Yes. Yeah, I know. It's really hard to see. Yes. There are At people the like back. What do, what do you want a word for? I don't want a word, but I have a question because I heard recently that Indonesian is one of the easiest languages to learn because it's very precise. You only have one word and everything. Oh. So I was wondering whether you thought that there was a beauty in languages that are less verbose and that are more precise. Yeah. And if, if you know anything. Gosh, I wonder if it is actually more precise or more limited. I'm, I'm sure it isn't limited, but um, that makes me feel quite sad in some ways because you may not be able to kind of get the nuance of everything if there's just one word. I'm just wondering how, how that works. But um, what was your second question? If I could recommend a language. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't, but it's a really it's a really nice question to take away. Actually, it's, together with Giles's one, which I'm still I'm still trying to get the word that you asked for. Um, but no, I did. But it's a really fascinating language. You know, which is the smallest, which is the biggest, and does the fact that we have so many words available to us mean that we are more expressive, or actually we just get you know just I don't know a bit woolly uh, in the end. One thing that. There, there's a, so much stuff about how English is going down the pan and, you know, the internet has ruined everything when all the research shows the opposite and the internet is really expanding language, etc. But the one area which does seem to be suffering is vocabulary and that does seem to be narrowing. So if anything, it's like we're almost not embracing the richness that we have in our language. But I'm definitely going to investigate that because I didn't know about Indonesian. Thank you. Well, here's one. Um, thank you for that because it leads me on, on the subject of concision to the Guinness Book of Records' most succinct word for 1994. <laughs> um, the word is... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that is pretty concise. But <laughs> the word is mamela pinna tapai. Oh, yes. And do you want to tell us what it means? Yeah, that is... Um... Well, it's usually sitting opposite someone, but it's kind of basically looking at someone and really wanting them to make the first move or to do something before <laughs> you, but neither of you can bring yourself to do it. So it's that kind of stasis um, where it's it's agonising and you both want to do something, but you just sit there looking at each other and not doing it. It doesn't have to be a love situation. It can be, you know, being the first to start eating. Um, what language does that come from? Is it? That is, um, isn't it Tagalog? Yes, that makes from Papua New Guinea. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So what yeah. is the process by which a word like that might enter the language? Well, that one's unlikely to because, like you, I can't, <laughs> I can't pronounce right. it. Um, but oh, we just we absorb languages all the time, and famously, we are a mongrel tongue, so we have hoovered up words from every single language that we've encountered and plundered um, over the centuries. So it's very easy for foreign words to come in, and if there is a need for it, and if it fills a gap, then, uh, you know, but I think that one probably, like a lot of the words I tweet, sadly, they don't trip easily off the tongue. So, you know, it's not very felicitous or, or um, harmonious or melodious. But, but yeah, very, that really helps. Very timely. I found that it was applicable to the position that Olaf Scholz found himself in right. with regard to tanks and America. Yeah, and oh wanting, gosh, yes. Wanting Biden to go first. And actually not saying anything, so we actually we didn't really know why he didn't yeah. want to do it, although we kind of did, you know, the whole history that was weighing on his shoulders, yeah. Okay, rapid That's fire, right. just a few more. Okay. Olfricht. Olfricht is the fear of running out of beer. Nice. Uh, Danish, yes? Yes. I, I, I recognised in the second syllable uh, part of the word for fear of flight popularised and definitely adopted in English 
thanks to Greta, right? Oh, okay. So what what is the fear of flight word? I mean the the, the uh, no not flying for environmental reasons. Flug flugfrick. Oh, maybe flugfrick would be in German. That's weird. That suggests to me that the word hasn't entered the English no. language as I thought. It I doesn't enter my. As in sort of reluctance to fly for environmental right, reasons. Right, right. Okay. When she sailed across the Atlantic instead of flying, everybody was using it. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and uh, we could go on and on, but I think that there's um, uh, abiocco, which I experience every day, which I think yes. of as, as food coma. Yeah. 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 Uh, oh, but this is just the most wonderful. Kuchisabishi. Oh, that's the, uh, yeah. We have some. So this is uh, comfort eating, essentially, but from the Japanese, and it basically means eating because your mouth is lonely. <laughs> it's just so gorgeous, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Oh, Japanese, again, they do, yes, there's just this, this, this lots of wonderful stuff that, in there. I think it's really worth us making an effort to absorb that one. Yeah. Um, lonely I, mouth. I've got lonely mouth. I need something to eat. <laughs> Definitely. Um. And then some ones that were uh, obviously uh, English, frobbly mobbly. Yes, that's the um, centuries old equivalent of meh, essentially. <laughs> like, um, how are you? I'm. I'm frobbly mobbly. Yeah, neither one thing nor the other, really. I'm just meh. Yeah. yeah, blah. Uh, what does daddle dum do mean? Daddle dum do is me incarnate. This is a daydreamer. Really? Yeah, it's probably looks back to um, somebody who was going da da dum da dum da dum as so they were kind of strolling down the road. So yeah. speaking of dreaming, mm. the word dreamy has an entry, I think it's in, in the emotional dictionary, mm. and in the same entry you talk about man dream, uh, and I forget the meaning, but I was really struck by the fact that you did not include as a meaning okay. dreamy as often applied to uh, attractive men. Ah, yes, okay. I didn't, because, yeah, I wouldn't use that myself anymore. He's very ah, dreamy. Okay, would you, so I'm just. Would, uh, you, would you still call a woman dreamy? She's very dreamy. Well, I think it's used. Okay. May, maybe the uh, no is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but, no, I love, I, I love that actually. Dream had to, um, sort of slightly wider um, applications um, years ago, but there's a lovely one. Uh, which is glee dream and glee began uh, it, it was again a wider word and it meant um, entertainment mirth uh, and a glee dream was me a me delight in minstrelsy so it was basically loving music um, I'm in a glee dream I thought it was lovely that's great that's from old English that one yeah yes another potentially missing word it's a word for when you have a point to make or a question to ask and it's probably made worse by being told but the conversation <laughs> ah, the frustration at not at not actually getting a word in. Um, hmm, I'm failing really badly here. Um, yeah, I can't I can't fill all these gaps. Is there a word for? Well, there's lots of words for frustration. See what? Oh, I don't have my phone with me. There, if you um. I, I'm guessing you probably could get a subscription to the Oxford English Dictionary. So institutions, particularly libraries, can get a subscription. And what the OED now has is a historical thesaurus. So you can look up synonyms. So I could look up frustration and look up synonyms for that since old English times. And it will also give you sort of more specific circumstances. And it's just the best read, honestly. You can just get completely lost in it. Um, but I can't think of one for that exactly. I'm sorry I'm being... That's fine. It, 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 it's probably a, a cruel uh, idea no, to force someone actually, in your position to invent words on the spot. I love the idea that there are these gaps to fill because it means, yeah. you know, there is still a lot of work that we all need to do. And, and life know, is changing. Life so, is changing. And we're really, sometimes I feel like language, for English particularly, is so versatile and it's so amazing and it's so speedy. But so, there are just some areas where it's really slow to catch up. And you just think, why have we still not got, you know, a proper gender neutral pronoun why do we have there's just some things where you think wow actually we've been asking ourselves this for a very very long time and people have 
um, complained about they as a singular pronoun, for example, for a very long time, but we've still not done anything about it. So that's a, I find that quite Do you think there might puzzling. be some evolution, linguistic evolution there, that will alight on something else? Oh, we definitely will. But but when? It just, you know, it seems, seems like we've been waiting a long time for that. And there are just other areas in language where you just feel like, you know, get a move on. But it's all down to us. It's a democracy. You know, it will move as we want it to move. Great. Down here on the sofa, both of you, and, and uh, I've seen you at the back. On there first, and then you, madam, and then at the back. Yeah. Okay. Can you? Is there a best way to say how are you, or some more creative ways to say how are you? So, for example, if you if you don't really want to know how somebody is, <laughs> yes. or like yes. you know somebody feels like shit, uh, and you want to talk about it. Like, yeah. A, I feel that's really. I said again, that's actually. The linguistic equivalent, uh, sorry, the, the body language equivalent of a, of a verbal gap is is what we do when we greet someone because we can never get the kissing right. We always end up, you know, bumping noses. We don't do the on both sides, bingo, that's it. We just are so blooming awkward after all this time. And I feel like it's the same with greetings. Uh, you know, if you ask an Australian, how are you? They've They've kind of, well, they ask you, how are you? And you're, you're answering. They're kind of already halfway down the corridor because they never really wanted an answer in the first <laughs> yeah. place. But we say, yeah, I'm fine, thanks. How are you? And we have this whole blooming formula. Um, I like what cheer, which, um, <laughs> which um, cheer, it is nice. And actually, well, it, the cheer was um, an old word for mood. So what's your mood, essentially, is what it's asking. Um, and, but we used what cheer because it eventually morphed into watcher. watcher. Yeah. Um, but I like watch here and it's genuinely asking what your emotional state is so you don't have to answer if you don't want to but I really like that one okay, yeah but I do wish we could this is great um, does everyone, anyone know the meaning of Lyft which is the book by John Lloyd and, and Douglas Adams and it was essentially taking town and um, village and city names in Britain and um, using those to fill linguistic gaps in English um, and Harpenden was the endless exchange of goodbyes that we have when we're trying to end the phone conversation. It's like, love you, yes, yeah, see you, see you, love you, bye. And that, we need a word for that as well. Um, and speaking of German, just very quickly, Ben Schott, uh, yeah. Schott's Miscellanies, did this brilliant book called Schottenfreude, where he also identified linguistic gaps and then made up, where well, he found a translator to make up German words to fill them. And my favourite is Deppenfahrer Beugung, which is the compulsion to stare at the person you're overtaking in your car. <laughs> <laughs> So we all do that as well. Um, That's great. Sorry, that was uh, a really good one. Uh, briefly, if we can, you... Oh, um, um, some people have a sort of instinctive aversion to certain words, aesthetically, yes. like moist yes. gives a lot of people the ick. Yes. Is there a word for feeling the ick about a word? Well, the ick is a really good one, isn't it? <laughs> um, and I don't know if that was born on Love Island or not. I think it probably was. I think Love Island has actually been quite productive linguistically. <laughs> um, muggy and melt and all that stuff. Um, is there a word that gives you the ick? It's that kind of repugnance, isn't it? A word repugnance. But particularly for words. I yeah. If, if as someone with such linguistic joy, whether there are any words that you're like, oh, yes. I just don't like the feeling of that in my mouth. Yes. Gusset. <laughs> I don't like gusset and I don't like flange either um, or bulbous um, yes I think actually flange might be the word but I don't know why it just Excellent. sounds horrible um, but yeah the linguistic ick we do need a word for that you're right I think I've got over the M word actually Linguistic. There That's you excellent. go. That, I like that. Very One more good. at the back and then Mark's going to get cross with me. Yes. Um, so in the other language I speak, there's no word for because. It's quite Ooh. random Ooh. language. It's called Kanza from like South India. Yeah. So on the, what you were saying about the culture of where it is, and yeah. the determinant of the cultural language, yeah. where do you stand on that? Where do I stand on it? I think um, inevitably because English follows as we need it to, except, you know, as I say, sometimes it's quite slow. I think language inevitably adapts to us. I mean, I think that's a given. Um, it has to because, you know, we need, if there's new technology invented, we need a word for it, etc. So we do determine our language. But I do also, I do feel, think actually that um, that our language does it would be fascinating to see whether that's affected you in any way at all 
between cause and effect, whether you have a different view of the way the world works or what to expect, you know, in terms of consequences, etc. I, I definitely think there's something there. And I think it's something quite mystical there as well in, in terms of how our language shapes us. I was reading today, um, and I recommend this to anybody, Toni Morrison wrote this beautiful Nobel, um, Nobel Prize uh, speech on language. It's the most exquisite writing about language I think I've ever read. And she talks a little bit about how language shapes us as well as the other way around. So I would really recommend that. Yeah, but that's fascinating, isn't it? No word for because. So do you use things like for or therefore? I don't know. They all just kind of rumble into one another. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's like, I'll just be like a verb or like a noun or something. And then I'll be like, oh, okay. Yeah, that's fascinating. Really yeah. Thank you for that. That's really Thank interesting. Thank you. Well, look, late's run on a very tight schedule. I, yeah, I'm going to have to wrap things up so you will have time for a, another drink before we proceed. We agreed before quaff -tide. we... quaff tide. It's quaff tide. It's time for a drink. Well, we also <laughs> agreed yeah. that that there was one particularly lovely word, hupatana taditis, oh, yes. a Finnish word for the pleasure of dropping into an armchair. Yes. It's been a, a great hupatana taditis <laughs> well Thank to you. drop into an armchair with you. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you. Thanks for watching that video. If you enjoyed that, we think you'll love these. And if you want to join us for the next live recording of Tortoise Lates, head to tortoisemedia.com forward slash book.